Geological Oceanography Lecture 3 Deep Sea Floor Features. This is Lecture 10 of this unit study. Mapping the Sea Floor Features. This is a, a field of oceanography called bathymetry, and bathymetry studies the sea floor and maps the sea floor elevations. If you were to do this on land, this would be called topography. And you could take that when you are in the geography or geological sciences. So on land, it's topography. When you're a marine scientist, you're doing bathymetry. And there are several techniques used. Early explorers measured the depth using rope. And the results often were inaccurate because they'd lower uh, a weighted rope down until it reached the bottom of the floor. Then they would measure the, 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 the length of rope as they lowered it down to see how long that rope was and that's how they would get their their uh, elevations of the seafloor but eventually due to advances in sciences and technology we uh, developed, scientists developed this thing called an echo sounder and an echo sounder determines the depth by measuring the time required for a sound to leave a ship reflect off the bottom and return uh, back to the ship to where a sonar device was located <clears throat> Uh, there's also a multi-beam sonar system and this takes several soundings and when you talk about soundings it's several measurements at the same time. This is a, a much uh, quicker method for doing uh, ocean bathymetry because you could scan a greater surface of the ocean's, ocean seafloor. And even further advances in today's day and age we can now use satellite imagery and satellites measure very large-scale seafloor features by determining changes in sea surface elevation. So as you often know that water is displaced when you put an object into it so you can measure the surface of surface elevation of seawater and try and get some type of idea of the type of uh, seafloor uh, features that are found at the bottom of the ocean. So here you can see that multi-beam sonar system coming off of a research vessel there and over here this would be a representative of what satellite imagery would look like when you're measuring bathymetry and we will do an activity online related to ocean bathymetry so what are some deep seafloor features you've all all heard of at one point of uh, the, the continental shelf continental slope continental rise uh, whether you've studied this in uh, your basic oceanography class in Earth and Space Science in middle school, or if you're watching uh, a movie like A uh, Thousand Leagues Under the Sea or some type of Discovery Channel, you may have heard of Discovery Channel program, you may have heard of the shelf or the slope of the rise. So these three basic features. The continental shelf is close to the coastline. It's nearly, uh, nearly flat borders on the edge of the continents, that slope toward the ocean bases, basins. It is the continental shelf, uh, typically where if you are uh, swimming in the ocean, you're swimming in this region of the seafloor. The continental slope is a steep slope that extends to the sea, extending to the bottom of the seafloor. And then you have the continental rise. The continental rise is a gentle slope formed at the base of the slope of the continental slope due to accumulated sediment. So here's your, your continental shelf, your continental slope, and your continental rise. The abyssal plain, when you travel into the abyss, the abyssal plain is a vast plain extending seaward from the base of the continental slope. So here you have the, the continental shelf, continental slope, Continental rise would be that little area there, and down here would be the abyss. A mid-ocean ridge is an underwater mountain range, typically having a rift valley running along its spine. So here you have that mid-ocean ridge. That valley region between the ridge would be the, the rift valley there uh, between the two peaks. This is what we saw when we looked at the mid-Atlantic ridge. So the mid-Atlantic ridge is that divergent plate boundary we have new plate forming, so you have a lot of volcanic activity there, and you get these ridge zones that would uh, push the plates away from one another. A seamount is a steep-sided volcano rising abrupt, abruptly 
sometimes piercing the surface, creating island formations. So here you can see the seamount forming here. Uh, this here would be <clears throat> typical, a seamount would be typical with island formation over hot spots. So the uh, Hawaiian Islands are, are seamounts. And then you have a gaio, and a gaio is a flat top seamount. So due to erosion and stuff, you get that flat top there. So if we look here, we see uh, another diagram. So here we have the continental shelf. Here's the continental slope. And then you have the continental rise here. And now you have the trench, a gaio, uh, the abyssal plain. Here you have that ridge and rift valley. So the ridge would be the mountain ranges. The rift valley would be the, the valley between them. Here you have the abyssal plain again. Now we're coming over towards the other continent. Here you have the continental shelf continental shelf here, Where, where's my arrow, continental rise, continental slope, continental shelf, shoreline, land. A trench is a long narrow depression of the seafloor. It's the deepest part of the ocean floor. Uh, this is occurring at subduction zones, so where you have uh, plates, one sliding beneath the other, you get trench formation. Uh, tectonic plate boundaries, converging sub subduction uh, causes mountain ranges. Uh, you may have heard of the Marianas Trench uh, out in the Pacific Ocean and you did that when you, in your one activity you had to map that. And then if we look so here we could see here is that Mid-Atlantic Ridge here with the Rift Valleys and then they're pushing towards the uh, Africa and Eurasian Plate and then over here towards the North American plate and South American plate. And then here is the uh, East Pacific rise. So you have the Pacific rise there or the ring of fire. Types of marine sediment. There are uh, four different ways uh, marine sediment can be found in the ocean or, or its origin. Uh, you have lithogenous or pterogenous sediment, which comes from land and carried to the ocean via wind or water. Biogenous sediment it comes from organisms composed of calcium carbonate. Uh, th that would be some type of shell or hard casing that that organism is found in. You have hydrogenous sediment, which is precipitated directly from seawater and tends to be metal components of manganese or, or ferrous, which is iron. And then you have cosmogenous sediment, which comes from outer space, such as meteorites. And they tend to be metal uh, composites often darker in coloration. So here you can see what typical lithogenous sediments look like. Biogenous sediments, this is uh, pictures of foraminifera. I'm going to look at some of those in lab. Here is hydrogenous sediment which is uh, precipitated out of seawater. And here you can see that darker coloration of uh, cosmogenous sediment uh, from meteorites. So when you go to the beach, you know, depending on what coast you're on, if you're on the coast of New Jersey, you have that very fine particle sand, but as you travel north towards New England states, uh, you don't have that very fine sand anymore. You start to have uh, pebble and cobblestone beaches. So when you talk about the sediment size on, uh, that you can be found at the beach, you're going to use the Wentworth scale. And the Wentworth scale classifies sediments based on the size. Sorting indicates the distribution of grain size of the sediments. So you could use the Wentworth scale and a sorting technique. Um, some of us, uh, we did this in, in environmental science where you put it into a sediment sorter and you shake it up and there's a little screen at each level and the particles will pass through. So a uh, well sorted beach uh, is when all the sediment is the same size. Uh, this would be very typical of the New Jersey coastline or those sandy beaches. Uh, poorly sorted sediment uh, beach would be up in New England coast where you have rocks, pebbles, sand. So that would be poorly sorted. The sediment size is very variable. And here you can see. So the grain size, pebbles, granules, coarse sand, medium sand, fine sand, silt, and clay. This would be typical of grains and matrix. Here would be well sorted where the particles are all relatively the same. Here would be poorly sorted where you have uh, roughly different sizes, various sizes here of sediments found in that sand. And then here you have a description of what that sediment looks like. Is it angular, sub-rounded, well-rounded? 
The Holtstrom diagram shows how sediments move in water based on their size. So basically, we know that erosion is an erosion, an erosion type process, sediment is going to be removed. And then you have the transport of that sediment. So sediment is going to move along the substrate or the bottom, uh, 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 in the bottom of the uh, ocean floor or river or being suspended somewhere. And then eventually you have deposition where the sediment is deposited somewhere. So it's no longer moving. So erosion picks it up. Then you have that transport method, and then eventually you have deposition depending on the particle size. So here you can see the erosion of particles from the bed. Here you can see that, that transition zone. And then you have the non-cohesive clay and silt in that transition zone. And then you have the sedimentation of particles into the bed. So you can see these three different areas here and the velocity of those particles in these zones in centimeters per second up the y-axis and then you can see the grain size in millimeters along the x-axis and up here um, you can see the various ranges of what those grains are so down here in this zone you have clays in this zone here from 0 0.005 millimeters up to about a little more than 0 0.05 millimeters you have the silt then you have your fine and medium the coarse sand which is a little bit above 0.05 and extends all the way up to one millimeter. So think about one millimeter and how big that is on a meter stick. And then of course you have pebbles that range from a little less than five millimeters up to uh, about 50 to 60 millimeters in size and then much larger than that are the cobbles and boulders. So there you could see the Holstrom diagram and how it will relate to that Wentworth scale. And that's all for geological oceanography, everyone. Have a great day.